We're honored to have James Calder join us today. James is a global director of ERA Co. It's a consultancy that sits at the transformative space between creativity and consulting to enable clients to tackle a 21st century uh, biggest challenges. He's an early pioneer in activity-based workplace design and a leader in workplace strategy for the digital age. Well, thank you for joining us and doing this with us. This is very important. Our themes are our discussion is a pretty critical discussion as we look to the future of this inextricability between, between uh, equity and healthiness and the environment. But before we go to that altogether, if you'll remember, uh, we've been talking about a, a few things, not the least of which is when you have passed through your COVID world, uh, like the rest has in our world, um, there have been a tremendous number of changes that have occurred in society, in the way we think, in the way we shop, in the way that we behave sometimes, the way we interact with each other like we're doing right now. So many changes that have occurred. What would you say are some of the lessons that you've observed, not only for yourself, but the practice that you're in, and perhaps the wider the wider swath of clients and stakeholders, the, the lessons learned and perhaps lessons actually adopted during this time. Yes. Um, it, there's been so many changes. It's not a, um, a simple sort of question to answer because uh, there, are, there are so many sort of little ways that our lives have changed. In some ways, I don't think we're really aware of. I think probably the best way of describing it is, you know, in Australia where we've started to come back, you know, over the last six or seven months and we're in the very fortunate position of having sort of very few um, cases in the community. Um, probably a bit of an example for, for North America and other parts of the world as, as you get vaccinated. The, the, it's, there's a lot of small different, and, and when people come back, they, there's an anxiety about it. It's, a, it's, it's not a... It's not that sudden releasing and fun when people go back to work, for example. It's everyone's quite cautious and uh, and anxious, including myself. And I'm not an anxious person, but it, 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 you know, like some of my team are coming back in Melbourne this week, and you know, everyone's quite nervous about. It. I think that's an indication of how fundamentally we've been affected by the the, the changes that have gone on. But there's, I mean, one of the, my my field of expertise is work, so that's probably you know, one of the, my main focuses. Um, but we're definitely seeing what I would call the democratization of distance, where, you know, people that used to be remote were always second class in some way. And there's lots of evidence about, you know, last to get promoted, lower. I think that's now gone. I think what, what a lot of organizations have realized is obviously you can, you can actually manage people remotely. Um, you can hire people remotely. Um, that you, know, you can you can get talent that you wouldn't have been able to get, and those industries like technology um, in various sectors have embraced this with a with a zeal about um, you know using as a tool to attract talent. Whereas I think some of the more conservative industries will probably try and go back to what they had before, um, and and there are a number of challenges around. Um, management of people that have been based on presenteeism and and uh, you know the the traditional sort of office and rows of desks that is totally being turned on its head now. Um, many of my clients are actually significantly more productive <laughs> by going into you know the commute, the the rows of desks, and all that, and, and being able to reprogram work. So let me ask you: with that being the case, how are they dealing with? or are they dealing with cultural changes that occur within in the organization? Because there's something about the proximity of humans with each other that has one cultural set of artifacts. And then there is the uh, humans in this context that has its own off-putting uh, in it. How, how are your clients dealing with and how are you folks uh, advising them around this pretty critical dynamic of culture in workplace. Yeah, that's right. Um, if we start to think of you know, the first question people are asking, well, you know, how much space do I now need? But before you can answer that question, you now you need to think, well, 
how, how do we want to work? How do our, our sort of values, cultures, norms, how are we going to recalibrate them for this, this more flexible, you know, mix of remote sort of hybrid working? And, uh, you know, we're really at a point where we, we've got to actually reprogram the way we do work, whether it's a, a design firm, you know, we've learned now you can actually do competition entries remotely and, and, and pull specialists from all around the world. And, hey, we can, you can even do pitches and win, win projects remotely by never, you know, never even meeting a client face-to-face. We've proven all of that. Um, so it, it, it is going to change all of those. I think that's what will really take time. Whereas the, you know, the immediate move to sort of remote working, you know, people that didn't have them were given laptops and screens within a week or two. And, and it was incredibly fast. People were blown away how quickly it could, it could happen. Um, many of us, like consultants like myself, we've been working like that for decades. So it's, it's no, it's, it's, it's pretty normal. But I think, uh, and I'm, I'm here with a client now that's very focused on face-to-face as their culture. You know, it's a, the, the the CEO knows the kids' names of all of the all of the employees, and and that's been sort of slightly traumatic to to suddenly have that turned off when it was a very you know in the office every day face to face. So we're helping them at the moment to redefine well what does face to face actually mean. In 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 the past, I think we were a little bit maybe lazy about it. We just put people in rows of desks and expected them to do more team type work. But probably with the remnants of culture and space of the normal rows of desks, I think it's going to be very interesting for things like architects' offices that are they they're, they're the same all around the world. It's just rows and rows of desks. Same with engineers' offices. Um, and I think you know clearly, if you're going to then get people to come in, this culture around teamwork is now much more important than it was um, before COVID. So that I think we will see the final shift from individual and sort of um, hierarchical to very much team and activity focused work, which will drive cultural behaviors around that. We talk often at Design Intelligence about another linkage, like we talk about, uh, you know, equity and healthiness and the environment. We talk about another triplet and it's called responsibility, accountability and consequences. And we think that this is somewhat redefining our meaning of responsibilities when you and I are going to stay in this virtual context in our face-to-faceness that we're having. There is a new heightened awareness around accountabilities because even though I used to believe I could hold you accountable because I could walk by your cubicle and look at you, I really had no idea what you were doing in there, but it made me feel good that I could look into your cubicle, right? But now I, now I can't look into your cubicle and see what you're doing. I can electronically, and then suddenly Big Brother is, is become radically intrusive in your life. So how are you folks dealing with, and speaking into this space around this idea of a new awareness of accountabilities in this virtual culture? I, I think it's, I mean, generally it's surprised managers um, how productive people are without them <laughs> peering over their cubicle. <laughs> That's a, it's a euphemism. Um, that they, you, you know, uh, people like to work, people like to, you know, be part of a team and contribute and 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 be responsible. Um, so I, th- I think it's changed that management style of what we sort of call presenteeism, um, you know, forever, I think, because, you know, a lot of organisations have realised that people are more productive without their supervision and, <laughs> and, and can actually create their own connections. But, I mean, the bit that, that hasn't worked at all well is the cross-team type connections and I think there's still a very serious role for for leaders um, of of organizations and groups to manage very carefully that that cross team and whole of organization you know if you will the the sort of the social aspects of of work um, are going to require a whole new skill set and clearly we're now competing with home and other places for people's time during the week so or during the working week. So we need to um, create spaces that will encourage them and attract them and make it worthwhile for them to 
come in. That's what we're finding as, as people roll back in cities across Australia, that people are coming in and then bouncing out again because half the people they wanted to meet are not there that day or the, there's no spaces to do their, their Zoom calls. You know, they're stuck in a cubicle trying to do them. Um, uh, various aspects like that. Are, but, you know, it's with all the COVID restrictions, it's not a pleasant environment. It's, you know, in some countries where masks are being worn still, you know, it's that's half the reason you go in is to read people's facial expressions and, and, and that's not working. So other lessons outside of workplace as you look across the Australian society, government interaction that's happening city to city as you travel, what other observations are you having of new lessons learned along the way? Yeah, I think there's a general feeling that that um, whilst there might have been a growing awareness of um you know, nature and sustainability and the planet that that now we've been bitten. I think we're much more aware of nature and and the earth and and you know the fact that we we are actually an organism, um, not exactly a godlike creature. We're actually part of an, an ecosystem, and that's been brought home very clearly. So there is a, a an overwhelming um, understanding of how we fit in with with the planet uh, across all aspects. Um, so we're, we're seeing, you know, owners, developers, investors of, you know, creating the built environment, the way we're thinking about cities, it's, it's, it's made a real leap um, in, in this time. The other thing is, um, you know, distance is that people, are, people are wanting space. They're not so worried about distance anymore. So there's been a, there's been a move away from the, the cities uh, in small apartments to to, to the countryside to, to have space and, and the fact that you might only have to commute, you know, two or three days or less means that you can be quite a long way away. So we've seen a, you know, a, a surge in prices of, of, and demand for, for what would have been rural properties now as legitimate places to live and work. Amazing. That's a key trend. Yeah. And we're also seeing um, the shopping centre is actually, you know, transforming into a, a 15 minute city with all the diversity that that would have with health workplace hospitality even civic type events and spaces happening in what was a mono kind of space all around retail and leases is now you know i think going to transform over the coming decades into a into a vibrant sort of part of that that immediate precinct that people can access isn't that extraordinary? Isn't that wonderful? I mean, isn't that the way it should have always been, where we are serving our community within a short distance and literally meeting the, the vast majority of their need within the 15-minute uh, context? Really interesting. It, it is. And I think what's, what's emerging, too, is because we've had to challenge our thinking quickly, it, it opens the door for other kind of thoughts and I think this idea that you know we are rapidly urbanizing as a planet and what does that mean and and just the complexity of our cities I think we've got a you know a view in our mind of cities that's probably 20 or 30 years out of date and and you know there's a whole reprogramming around how are we going to live on this planet in increasingly bigger numbers in cities and and what is that going to look like and and those 15 minute city ideas which have been around for decades uh, you know, uh, I think that time has come as a really, um, you know, interesting way. And I can see that the we, we don't really have the the mechanism yet. You know, we've got architects and urban planners, but now we need, you know, ecologists and all sorts of specialists working together to formulate what that future is going to look like. So I, 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 I'm sensing your enthusiasm and optimism for the things that will come out of this. And I, I'm, I'm with you on this. I think that there's going to be some real... Um, positive outcomes for, for the way we live. It seems that the, the larger, um, the cities that we look at today um, have left their original context. Uh, that is to say, in the United States, you have New York City or Boston or Philadelphia. Some of these cities, even though they became rather large, uh, in their early days, e even though they were large, relatively speaking, in that period of time, um, they really were made up of a conglomerate of neighborhoods. Hmm. And there wasn't this, this no man's land. It was just neighborhood to neighborhood that kind of morphed into each other. The cities today uh, have pushed the neighborhoods far away and they've become this massive no man's land where workers come and then abandon. 
And then you have all this emptiness and then they come and then they abandon. And I think we're, we're moving back to a place where the community, I'll call it the community or the neighborhood uh, of the new future city, the new smarter city is going to be um, a morph of the old and the new bringing together these ideas of community and neighbors, uh, but yet being highly technically uh, empowered to do things we could have never done, of course, a hundred years ago. And it's a, it's a beautiful blend of both that creates this 15 minute city. Or if you want to move to another part of the city, you can get the same services in that 15 part minute part of the city. Yeah. Which and, has a different character and vibe and feel and you can, you can tailor things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, L Lewis Mumford, the, the sort of the father of urban history, uh, the turn of the last century, he, he grew up and, and used to walk around all the streets of, of New York and he was bemoaning the, the fact that these neighbourhoods were being ripped down to have much bigger sort of monoculture buildings in their place. And um, that's kind of what Sturdy is thinking about the history of cities and, and that whole discipline was, was based on, you know, exactly as you described uh, in New York. Wow. So I, I think there's some um, reprogramming, not of only of work, but of life and around, you know, the growing creative industries as we get incredibly efficient around, you know, food production and, and, and um, manufacturing. And, and, you know, there's clearly going to be a, a continued growth around the creative industries and, and how we then create these communities around that um, that, that are, that are going to be, you um, you know, have their place in the world. I mean, I'm, I'm doing a fair bit of work in uh, one of Australia's smaller cities, Adelaide, which is just over a million people. But, you know, within a decade, it's actually transformed itself with, a, with the world's second largest biomed precinct and a, and a new manufacturing hub. And it's creating a whole, you know, energy around um, things you wouldn't have imagined 20 years ago and, and really surprising for the for, for some of the residents that live there that, hey, you can, you can get the... the um, the, the focus of Elon Musk to build a, a battery farm, you know, in the country to to solve the energy problems, and uh, you know, it's it, it's really exciting. I think um, what we, what we be able to do. So when we when we look at some of these uh, lessons we've learned along the way, and we're already starting to to talk about the next shift, which is what will be the permanent changes that we are forecasting, uh, things that will not go back, things that will not just revert back to pre-pandemic, but will be forever changed. What are some of those, those dynamics, whether they're close or whether they're more spread out? I think this idea that, um, uh, we, I think with the way we use space will, will change forever. Um, we, we will be much more focused on coming together for a specific purpose, as opposed to just punching the clock, I think that was a that was a tired remnant of of kind of factory thinking. Um, so I think we've we've broken the shackles of that. I, I do expect that a lot of organisations will try and not change, and will will just try and you know do what they were doing before. So I, I'm imagining like a lot of change, you get this burst. And then some of it reverts and then you get this broad trend over decades that all change just you know leadership changes so i imagine that's a bit of how what we'll do i think we've we've broken the shackles of of distance in terms of specialisms so i think we're now you know we've got the the power of the internet we've got um um focused communities as we were talking about you can now compete anywhere in the world anytime um, so it, it, it's just, I think, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? We, I'm just thinking about it. We've, one hand, we've, we've connected all the dots globally, but we're also focusing locally. It's, it's um, yeah, I think we're removing some of those industrial age shackles uh, as, we, as we move ahead. So what is this meaning to the, to the built environment, to the architect, to the engineer, to the constructor? This is a pretty big change that will rock their world at the end of the day because we've been living on a particular paradigm at least for the last 50 years. We've had, a, we've had these, as you called it, these monolithic type of building projects that we do. And you and I are prophesying something different perhaps in the future or some break from that exclusively. What does this mean to our community of designers and constructors? 
Well, I think there's a fair bit of inertia in those the investment side of those products. I mean, a lot of these building types are investment products first and and human uses second. Um, and I think we will see um, more diversity in that model. So I, I think the the current assets will persist and we'll but we'll also see hybrids of and new types of assets emerge. Um, I think we'll we'll see a lot more um, openness and forward thinking from uh, developers and and clients, um, which I, I think you know in a way I think the industry has been kind of getting ready for this. We've 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 been sort of pushing ahead of potentially what clients or whatever want want to actually commission and challenging. But now I think the gates are open a bit and we can actually move forward with some of the things we've been chipping away at. And I think it's now, you know, this idea that nature bites back, I think has raised the whole the whole bar and thinking about sustainability and the the humanness of space in a very different way. And also the the fundamental change too is around flexibility. I mean we've We've had our certainty kind of rocked um, and now we can, you know, everyone is wanting a lot more flexibility in what they're doing, um, whether they're, you know, leasing space or building space. So it's, it's a lot more dynamic um, than what it was before. It really is. You know, one of, um, one of the organizations that we are a research affiliate with is out of Australia, out of Sydney, called the Top 1000 Funds. And this is the organization that tracks the global pension funds uh, that make investments around the world. Most people in the public domain don't really know that much, uh, but these are this is the serious money behind a lot of the major global projects that occur. And they have a roll-up of environmentally responsible funds now uh, totaling over 50 trillion dollars, US dollars under management. And their number one initiative is towards sustainable design and construction and practices and manufacturing and distribution. I mean, they don't, they don't stop at the beginning, they run it all the way through. Their ambition is to, if you cut it, it bleeds green. Let's call it that way, right? And, and they are they are voting with their pocketbook. In other words, they'll make investment in firms that comply. And they will pull investment from firms that don't comply. And it's, it's, a, it's a pretty big stick and a pretty big carrot to have out there. And, and I'm hoping that what we're going to see is that these ultimate investors uh, are also using their power as investors to speak more steadily into this dynamic of projects that not are only are healthy or sustainable, but also leave an equitable footprint in the work that they do. What are you seeing in Australia toward this end, this, this, this move in the built environment that we can get to a place where every building all the time is designed and constructed to be equitable, healthy, and sustainable? It's a big. It's a big challenge for us. I will tell you because most of us in the built environment, you you say, well, we're we do a lot of sustainability, but the blinders are on to the inequities that are created from that, right? Or we're all about healthiness without thinking that it's a short-term healthy solution that doesn't have sustainability dynamics. So we want to see these inextricably linked in how we practice the work that we do. Mm, I, it's a difficult. I, I mean, I agree entirely because, you know, we're working with that sort of client and, and I, I completely agree with, with what you're saying. But I think what's quite interesting is actually the politics of it where the, the, the corporate money is now ahead of many governments in, in parts of the world and has a very different sort of attitude and, and focus of the, than the politics uh, or the, um, you know, the media of, of the day. Um, I, I think we just have to see how that's going to pan out. But, you know, like anything, once you build good examples, I mean, that's the great thing about, about humans. You know, when we started to build build things sort of six or 8,000 years ago, um, you know, the, the, the Winston Churchill quote, uh, quote that we, we, create, we shape our buildings and thereafter they shape us. And, and I think, you know, as we build better and better examples, 
it, it's harder and harder to go backwards or to hang on to the old. And, and you know, it doesn't take much. Just, um, you know, one example can now travel the world instantly and that becomes the new benchmark. So I'm, I'm hugely optimistic that as we, you know, our knowledge, our ability to work collaboratively and bring in different different experts and, 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 and streams. And, you know, one of the things that we're starting to do a lot more is understand sort of what, what we call the hierarchy of place. Um, you know, there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but, you know, what are we actually trying to do? And, and uh, underpinning all of that in places like Australia is actually the Indigenous, um, you know, understanding of the land because whatever happens, we're building on this place <laughs> and it's it's been here for as long as the earth has and there's been, you know, in Australia, we're incredibly lucky to have an Indigenous population that's, you know, been here for 60, 80, 100,000 years. So there's a there's this amazing storytelling about place which is hugely valuable in the narrative of what we can do. So if we start in that and then at the end of the top of the pyramid, you end up with with delight and, and you know, sort of the highest level of humanity, um, we can really start to change for the good the, the way we do buildings. Um, things like equity, you know, they, they become almost um, social type issues that, uh, you know, we, we need to untangle and, and reprogram how we think that because, some of the ideas clearly, you can see the friction points in, in politics around the world where you have that inequality and, and the, the urban problems that that cause. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just a, a wonderful conversation. Um, any insight you want to offer this audience about your perspectives around anything around the world at this point? Uh, we're, we're calling on Australia to speak to us. Um, I, I think what I hope is that we embrace the opportunities that, that are now afforded, uh, in front of us. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm working with a few clients at the moment. The, the issue for this change, it's not the next generation. They're, they, they're, you know, they're, they're, this is normal for them and, and they're, 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 you know, willing to try things. And I don't think it's really the, you know, the older people, because they've, they've probably seen, you know, the pace of change be slower than what they've got. It's really the middle, sort of particularly in, say, design firms, engineering firms, the middle manager type level that, you know, I, I, I just encourage people to be optimistic and use this opportunity to, to change because we need to. We can't, you know, a lot of the old models are, are very industrial age thinking. They're, you know, destroying the planet. They're not good for us, um, you know, I, I think there's there's a lot of opportunities to, um, you know, reprogram work, um, you know, ra rather than going back to before, I think, you know, encourage organisations to think about how they use space and time, how they can be more equitable with, you know, different groups um, and create a, a more productive but also, you know, lighter touch on the planet um, in, in how, we, how we move forward. I th that's it's not the most exciting thing to think about. I'm sure most of the people listening to this will think about the the buildings and the the design responses and all of that. But but I think a lot of this will come from just how we reorganise ourselves in the industry around space and time. Um, I, I think that's kind of the beginning point of how we can then start to replan our cities in a better way. This has been an extraordinary conversation. I so appreciate your use of language, your, um, your sensitivity to the many dynamics that are happening. Uh, James, thank you so much for joining us from Australia. Pleasure. Thank you.